good evening. Oh, that's loud. Sorry. But Kent, Kent and his fine crew are adjusting that quickly, as you see. Um, my first thanks tonight. I'm Brent Skidmore. I teach here in the art department. Um, and uh, I also run the Meet the Maker lecture series, which is where you are tonight. This, uh, this Meet the Maker lecture series wouldn't happen without a wonderful organization uh, called CCCD, Center for Craft, Creativity, and Design in Hendersonville, because they're our partner tonight in bringing Tom into town, because Tom uh, will tell you all about why he's here, and Katie's going to introduce Tom. So I'm just going to basically talk to you about the Meet the Maker series. We've got one more, which is April 6th, our first and only Friday evening event. But there's plenty going on that evening. Let me tell you a little bit about what's going on that evening. So we'll have a talk. Um, Daniel Carrico, who's a photographer, will talk between 5 and 6. And I think it will be pretty punctual because at 6 there are openings all around campus. Am I right about that? Yeah, I'm looking at Mark and he's giving me the okay on that one. Um, we've had a pretty busy week here. I just want to tell you what we've been doing. I see Paige Davis and Linda Medcalf and Corey Williams, who I want to thank uh, publicly again for their time spent with us at the Forge this week. We've had a, a blacksmithing residency at the Forge out back, and we have one more day. If you've participated in the residency this week, will you please raise your hand? I've got some in the back. Their hands are dirtier, it looks like. So um, Linda's clapping about that, but thanks for uh, to you all for being here, and thanks for Blue Ridge National Heritage for giving us that money to help do that. Without further ado, I'm going to introduce the Assistant Director of the Center for Craft, Creativity, and Design, Katie Lee, who is uh, absolutely one of the most fabulous people to work with, because uh, she makes it easy, and I uh, appreciate that. Thank you, Brent. That was very kind. So I want to thank Brent and the Meet the Maker Lecture Series for co-sponsoring this lecture with the CCCD. And I also want to thank the uh, Henderson County Arts Council and the North Carolina Arts Council who provided a grassroots grant in support of this exhibition that Tom Lozier and I co-curated um, and is supporting the gallery talk, which is tomorrow at 1 p.m. So if anyone's interested in seeing the objects in the exhibition relating to this lecture this evening, Join us tomorrow uh, down at the Center for Craft, Creativity, and Design at 1 p.m. So the concept for this exhibition, um, Torqued and Twisted, Bent Wood Today, came out of a personal interest of mine as someone who has very little experience um, working with wood and thinking about how to present an exhibit focused on wood that would challenge and educate both woodworkers and those of us who do not work in wood. I thought that by focusing on the technique of bending wood, especially works that really push the boundaries of what is possible with this material, that visitors would gain a deeper appreciation both for the material of wood, actually only for the material of wood, um, but I think this material is often taken for granted. Uh, we often don't think about wood, um, those of us who don't work with this material. Um, when I started thinking about this exhibition concept, I knew I needed an accomplice, someone who really knows this material and someone who could provide meaningful perspective on selecting both the artist and the objects for this exhibit. So who better, I thought, than Tom Lozer. Tom and I selected work by seven contemporary sculptors and furniture makers and two historical designers who all push the boundaries of what is possible with this material and this technique. We considered work that reflects the very techniques that are possible with bending wood using steam bending, stack lamination, or green wood bending. Tonight, Tom is going to talk both about his own work and about works that are in this exhibition. Tom is currently chair of the University of Wisconsin-Madison Department of Art and has led the wood and furniture area at UW-Madison since 1991. He holds a BA from Haverford College, a BFA from Boston University's program in artisanry, and an MFA from the University of Massachusetts, North Dartmouth. He designs and builds one-of-a-kind functional and dysfunctional objects 
that are often carved and painted and always based on the history of design and object making as a starting point for developing new form and meaning. He has received four visual artist fellowships from the National Endowment for the Arts. In 1993, he spent six months in Japan on an NEA Creative Artist Exchange Fellowship. In 2003, he spent six months teaching and researching in London. And in 2010, he collaborated with his wife, Bird Ross, on the design and fabrication of a non-traditional, highly interactive, and kid-friendly reception desk for the New, Mad the New Madison Children's Museum. So please help me in welcome Tom Lozier. Okay, we got a lot of images to get through tonight, so I'm going to be fast. Um, but thank you, Katie. It was really a pleasure to work with you. You made it easy. Katie's a curator. I'm not a curator at all. Um, but I'm going to talk a little bit about that. This is uh, just, just an image for you to look at while you're waiting. Um, that, that chair right there is one of my favorites. That's Samuel Gregg. That's an American chair. And there's various versions of it that, that are in most, you know, I've seen them in museums. There's an even more amazing version than that one where that side piece is a continuous piece all the way down into the front leg. So as you wander through museums and you bump into the Gregg chair, see if it's one of the stellar ones with that cool. So anyways, Katie called me and asked me if I wanted to work on this show. And um, I thought of this kind of work and how much I love it. And I, I said yes right away. And I thought about the uh, incredible Eames furniture. And so I said yes, and it's been really a great experience. I'm not uh, particularly a, a Bentwood person, although there's a body of work that I'll show you in a few minutes that probably led Katie to think that I was more of a Bentwood person than I am. This, this, I'm just going to quickly show you this. I'm more of a straight line guy historically. This is my sort of my ongoing role model and hero, the, the um, red blue chair from 1917. Um, by Garrett Rietveld. So um, I'm not going to say a whole lot about the piece. I think it's um, essentially a uh, very, very eloquent visual essay on how to support a body in space. And uh, the, the thing about it, it's coming up on 100 years old. And I think we've all seen it, we all know it. But if that piece had never been made and somebody made it now, it would be on every design blog by the end of the day. So it's, you know, it's still got that sort of freshness and that um, direct quality. So I'm going to go, go through some, some of my work. I'm kind of, I've kind of broken it for this presentation into some work that is seating related and then also some cabinet work. And then I'm going to, I'm going to morph into the Bentwood things. Um, so this is a folding chair that I did when I was first getting out of um, uh, my undergraduate training at the program in artisanry. And this was made in response to an assignment to make a production piece. And it's actually the closest thing I've ever made to a production piece. And it was a very, very important piece for me. It was, um, it's, it's made from a single sheet of plywood. And, and conceptually, at least, it can be um, d pretty directly traced to the Shaker concept of um, putting your chair on the wall out of the way when it's not being used. Um, and I was interested in the idea of having other people make parts for me, and I thought this would allow me to make the pieces very quickly. And making the parts goes very, very well, but unfortunately when I get the parts back, it's probably less than halfway done. And so then uh, you'll see that I get very involved with the finishes and the surfaces. And so it never really was a true production piece. But I did make about 36 of them, and I did have the parts made by subcontractors, and that all sort of worked. Um, this, and I made it from uh, 1987 until about 92 or 93. And it was really important in my career. It got a fair amount of exposure. It was picked up in the design world in some design magazines. And so I was sort of known as the person that did that folding chair, which was great for a while. But after about four or five years, I decided I'd had enough, and I stopped making them. And uh, this is the last group of five on, the, on your right. And in this image, you can get a little bit of a sense of how it um, See, do I get a pointer? Yeah. So there's two, there's two chairs. This is a, a pin, on a stainless steel pin that comes out. And then the um, seat drops down like that. 
and then this whole unit swings back into plane with the back part and the pin goes back through all the pieces and then there's a wall unit that you can hang them on the wall. So they're very much about existing in two-dimensional space and three-dimensional space and the transition from two-dimensional space to three-dimensional space. A much more uh, recent set of chairs that was thinking a little bit different about seating and this was thinking about um, proportion and sets and what's a set and what is the right what is the right chair for any given person and so it's a little bit of the Goldilocks principle of this chair is too big this one's too small that one's just right and so the, the kind of the middle chair in the grid is this one with very kind of straightforward normal proportions but what you're essentially looking at here is a graph of proportion so as you move from left to right you're looking at a variable of skinny to fat and as you move from front to back, you're looking at a variable of short to tall. So you get nine variations on proportion. And the only thing that stays the same is the seat height. And so what I was trying to do was actually to come up with nine chairs, which are pushing and pulling that proportion to nine different versions, but they all hopefully work somewhat aesthetically. So um, there are the three tall ones. There's the three middle ones and the three short ones. And the idea was then that a group of people, how are they going to organize themselves uh, if they're approaching this group of chairs? Is one going to be better one day? Is a different one different the other day? Or how does it interact with power structures and, and so forth? But it was kind of thinking about how um, variations in proportion relate to um, social interaction and so forth. Um, this is a reversible chair so that you can choose between a... Um, regular chair or a rocking chair, but if you, whichever one you choose, the other one's sort of over your head, towering over your head, and um, it, it works really fine. The, the interesting thing is, um, so, so in this picture you're looking at two different chairs, obviously. This is one of the chairs in, it, in its two positions, so when it's a rocker, it's kind of black and gray in color. When you flip it over, it has a different color set. One of the things that's interesting that I, the, you don't realize everything in the planning stage, but it's essentially a metronome because it has so much weight up high. And so its rocking action is, um, it's, it's got quite an exaggerated, uh, almost self-propelled rocking action by all that weight up high. And still working with rockers, I did a, a, a bunch of work that um, involves um, required cooperation. So these are my kids back, back when they were friendly and helpful. <laughs> and uh, all I had to give them was an ice cream cone afterwards. And uh, they actually had a, lot of, they had a lot of fun with the photo shoot, as you'll see. But the idea was two people can actually sit on it and, and do a sideways rocking action, and it's a lot of, it's a lot of fun. But it, as one person, it really doesn't work. It, got, it kind of goes out of balance, so it's a required collaborative sitting exercise. And then if you make one change in the structure, if you tilt them in, it, um, then it's a little bit more intimate when you're sitting next to each other, but when one person gets up, the other chair actually snaps more or less vertical and you can sit in it. And then if you reverse them, it just becomes that traditional American, or that traditional, they're usually called a tete-a-tete -tete chair, where it's, that's really the most intimate one where you're sort of facing each other. <clears throat> and then I did one more that took me a while to finish, so you'll see how much my daughter grew up in the interim. That's her again, and that's my wife, Bird Ross, that some of you know. So I'm, I'm interested in what happens when you're in these, in these uh, collaborative, cooperative sitting situations. I've also done some um, outdoor um, seating. This is in Germany, in a, in a town forest in Darmstadt, Germany. And... Um, you can see that they, they, manage, they micromanage their forests, so they wouldn't let me drill even a hole in any 100% healthy tree. So I got to use the trees that had been hit by lightning or were rotting out. But I thought this tree, was, this tree had been hit by lightning, so it was absolutely amazing. And I used rustic chair-making techniques and uh, always left out a component of the tree that was then, of the chair, which was then provided by the tree. So it requires the, the tree to stand up. And this is on a walking path. Um, with, it had about um, 50 artworks along it. And um, on the weekend, the Germans walk in the town forest. They're all there, and they walk around. And it's really, really fantastic. And so I did three different ones. This tree, you can see, is, uh, is in poor enough health that it has fungus, there's things growing on it. So that was OK to drill holes in that one. 
And the final one was a beautiful, beautiful um, tree trunk that was already on the ground. And I just added some seats to it. Um, this was working with a curator from Darmstadt who does a lot of public art projects. And, um, and uh, she then, the following year, maybe it was two years later, she came to Wisconsin and um, we did the project in northern Wisconsin in a much wilder uh, forest. The, the um, forester for northern Wisconsin, she made a connection with him and he agreed to do this, which is a little bit radical for northern Wisconsin. And we did an art, we did an art path, uh, we did an art path and um, I worked with my wife Bird and we used um, surplus chairs from the University of Wisconsin surplus store. And so we did a bunch of chair configurations in the forest that were slightly off the path. We tried to get people to sit down while they were walking and take a break. Um, so we worked with, um, in this case, just with wooden school chairs. And then we, all, then we did another set, where, which were green, vinyl, and aluminum chairs. And this guy here in the red sweatshirt, he's the forester for northern Wisconsin. And he loved the art projects. And um, these were little paired, um, intimate seating spaces for, some, for a social dialogue. And so they're sort of, you can see them sort of spread around in there. <clears throat> And the last one was a sort of a fairy circle of chairs um, around a tree. And I was uh, still on seating, but I like to work a lot with um, other materials when I find them and, I, and, and they're, they're appropriate. And this is a piece I did for the Madison Museum of Contemporary Art. Um, they're they're um, public seating and it's industrial, um, industrial felt, surplus industrial felt that I collected. And um, these two columns are the structural columns for the building. And so I just wrapped right around the structural columns for the building. Um, this, on the lower right, this is the, that's the window where they are. <clears throat> and then if you sort of look right to the back, that's the Wisconsin State Capitol where the, all the <coughs> political demonstrations have been going on that you've probably been hearing about. And um, so there, there it is at night. And um, I did one that was freestanding and um, so there you're getting a little shot of my woodworking shop. But for this project, we, we kind of turned it into a fabric workshop. And I bought this crazy machine. Uh, I started trying to cut this stuff with a very high quality pair of scissors. And I started bleeding in about 45 seconds. And so I talked with some people and I got a recommendation, which was right on target to get one of these um, slicing machines, which has a wheel on it and has never come under the purview of OSHA safety regulations. And it's just like, it's sort of like a handheld, free held meat cutter. And we cut miles of, we cut miles of felt with it and it, it never got dull, it never hesitated. That's my assistant Jeremy paying no attention to where his finger is. But um, it, was, it was a lot of fun. And so we, we put these together in my shop and you can see a little bit of the, um, whoops, oh no. Oh, I know what I did. And, um, then we rolled everything up, brought it into the site location, and then it was just a process of adding it on. And in the end, everything's clamped in place with um, industrial strapping from the packaging, in, you know, from like when you're loading stuff on a truck. And um, you can ratchet those down and put a lot of pressure. This is very, very hard felt, so it does not give easily. And um, so I really liked the way it worked to kind of squeeze that in and, show the, and kind of show the softness of the material. And um, I'm very, uh, uh, a lot of my work has stripes. You'll see that stripes is sort of a thing that is consistent through my work. And I can talk about that a little bit, but it was really interesting because I didn't start out thinking I was gonna be working with stripes with the felt, but I very quickly realized it was a lot of the same thing. <laughs> Isn't he, I, can, I can't not put that picture in. He's the cutest kid. <laughs> Um, another another project that was a non-wood project. This is a silk screen, a screen print and uh, wood block print that I did at uh, Tandem Press, which is a fine art printing press associated with the UW Art Department. And um, they occasionally will invite a faculty person to do an addition. And I came in with this idea of making a three-dimensional object, a constructible print, which has a history in the printmaking realm. 
And I thought they would roll their eyes and, and kick me out. But the technicians who work there actually really liked the idea. And it was just a wonderful experience to come in and basically we worked with folding paper and sort of figured out how the whole thing works. So the, the, it's a set of two prints. Uh, there they are on the wall. And if you follow the instructions on the two prints, you can construct this relatively useless paper chest of drawers. <laughs> but it has fully functional drawing uh, drawers and it's, um, it's, it, it very obviously goes back to that sort of interest in how things move from two dimensions to three dimensions that was in the early in the folding chair that I showed at the beginning. So this is what the print looks like up close with sort of a little bit of text, but mostly illustrations, which is supposed to show you how to put it together. So the idea is you'd buy the prints and take it home, and it's a kit. Um, and it was a lot of fun. In the, so like I wanted wood grain print on there, wood grain texture. And so what they did, first we printed one layer of brown, and then we took low quality exterior grade plywood and wire brushed it very aggressively so that the two levels of the wood separate, and then printed the wood grain on, which I thought was, it was amazing, the, some of the solutions that they came up with uh, once I told them what I wanted it to do. So, um, so I talked a little bit about stripes, and I, it's hard for me to say, I mean, the two things I can say is that I'm very interested in color relationships. And so one of the things I like about stripes is the way it puts two colors right next to each other and you see what's going on. And the other thing is that I think I, I use them partly as compositional elements, just as a way to, um, it's very, very hard to stop on a stripe. And I'm interested in the way it accentuates uh, specific forms. So I don't know if this is a good example to show that. But this is a, one of the better slides to show what some of my painted surfaces look like. And I'm um, painting primarily with milk paint and, um, and acrylic paints mixed together. But I almost always um, finish the pieces in the end in a way so that some of the wood is showing back through. So I get sort of a free third color out of the wood itself underneath. I used to use a lot of mahogany, but I've tried to stop using mahogany and I'm using a lot of cherry and other woods like that because I like the sort of the darker color coming through. So changing over a little bit to some cabinet, more um, pieces with closed in spaces. I've done a lot of blanket chests and I just for speed, I eliminated all the early blanket chests which were based on historical examples. And um, this is the last version of blanket chests that I did. Um, and what I did is I tried an inversion where it's not actually the lid that opens. The lid just stays in place and it functions as a sort of a bench. And the storage unit pivots out like a giant compass. So it actually can spin all the way around if you had a big enough room. And I, I don't know. I, I, I mean, I know it has some connection to the fact that you always pile stuff on top of lids. So it's, if you have to open a lid, it's usually hard to open. Um, th these were one of some of the very first pieces I made when I moved to Madison to the Midwest and the silos are very dominant architectural form. I'd never lived in the Midwest. These are uh, very, very tall, six and a half foot tall, um, month long clothes hampers for your dirty laundry. And so they were thinking about the fermentation process. And they're, uh, they're fully ventilated with thousands and thousands and thousands of holes. and um, the idea is you just keep throwing your clothes in the top and it can hold a lot of clothes. And then if you need to do your laundry at the end of the month, you can just open it up and pull everything out. But if you have, you, there's a mid-month retrieval port <laughs> if, if you need to get something back out mid-month. Mid so they were, they were a lot of fun to make. They're just open at the top. But there you get a little bit of sense of yeah, you can see the light showing through right there. Um, another set, this is, um, this is actually, uh, yeah, I did, that, I did this later. These are wall cabinets. They're, uh, uh, this one would be about five and a half feet long. And what these are is they're, um, they have drawers within drawers. And so you can see that there's one long drawer which moves left to right. So in the top it slid to the right, in the bottom it slid to the left. And in both positions, you see five drawers, but they're actually different drawers. So in one position, you get these five. This lower, 
the illustration isn't any way that the, any natural state for the piece. I just pulled all the drawers out just for illustrational purposes. So um, you, you, and so at any given time you can see five, but there's five more that are hidden behind. So it was a, a way of requiring interaction with the piece in order to fully understand what was going on. And I played with a couple different iterations of this. And so this one was a little bit different. This was based on um, a lack of synchro synchronicity between what's going on on the inside and what's going on on the outside. So again, you can slide that inner drawer. And now on the top, it slid all the way to the left. The only drawer you can open now is the one on the right. The rest of them are trapped. You can rattle them around, but you can't open them. So it's a question of fine tuning to access each of the five drawers. So this time you can see everything, but you can't access it. And I'm interested in that kind of changing picture that happens inside each window. And the final iteration of these cabinets was sort of turning it inside out so that in this case, the carcass or the exterior of the piece is what moves. And so the big knobs are supposed to be a visual clue that you grab them. And I think you can see that it slid to the left. There's more overhang on the left. And again, there's five more drawers which are hidden that you can't see. Um, so the upper picture is the transitional state, and the lower picture is slid to the right. So in the transitional state in the top, you can actually see all the drawers. And this one, in many ways, was the most, for me, was the most successful. It was kind of confusing. Like you could put something in, go back, open the drawer later, and the drawer that you thought you just closed was actually empty. But that was really just because somebody had slid the cabinet. So they, it started to have a little bit sort of like trick qualities, which I liked. Um, one of the ways that I've thought about chests of drawers and storage units is by actually breaking it down into um, drawers uh, existing as boxes within boxes. So this, was a, this is a, quite a tall piece. It's about seven feet tall um, chest of drawers, which is just made out of boxes of boxes. And again, boxes of boxes, but arranged on the wall. And this time, what's going on is um, if you, as you move from left to right, you've got sort of a normal sized drawer, but then there's this inverse relationship with the knob. So as the knob gets bigger and bigger, it kind of sucks the energy out of the drawer, and you end up with this giant two-fisted knob with this very small <laughs> reward behind it. And, and then um, a much more traditional looking chest of drawers, but taking the very basic, um, very standard size drawers and breaking them up into, uh, by inserting other drawers inside. So I played with this on a couple of different pieces and worked with different, um, different, color, different color patterns to make different things happen. So there you, in the lower right, you can see a drawer within a drawer within a drawer. And then there's drawers that open on different axes that come out of the side. And so the inside of the boxes is actually fairly complicated. And this, was a, it's, this is actually an identical structure, but painted in a different way so that it's a lot more obvious what's going on. Here you can see a little bit um, what happens on the inside in the lower right. And so it, I think partly I'm also starting to think about <clears throat> pieces that are um, a little bit demanding of the person that's using them. Like, what's the right way to use this piece? What goes in each kind of drawer? And then, uh, in this case, offering a smorgasbord of drawer sizes, so very much based on the, sort of my sort of ad admiration for the shaker proportions and the attention to all those sorts of details. But um, thinking about what if you have a chest of drawers that has 18 different drawers, none of them are the same, and they range from this super tiny one in the upper left all the way down to the very, to the very, very big one in the lower right, that question of what, what is it like to use this piece? What's, what goes in each sort of drawer? And also thinking a little bit about um, patterning and running patterning across multiple chests of drawers. But the other thing that's going on here is just um, turning some of the standard uh, proportions upside down, so putting the big ones on the top and the small ones on the bottom. It's, uh, it's, it's different from what we expect. It's like reading a book from right to left or bottom to top. I've spent a lot of time on proportion and scale and getting everything in the right place. Uh, yeah. 
just mostly just drawing it out by hand and looking at it. And then work, doing quite a bit working with these pairs of chess and working with patterns that went across multiple chess. And then it, this was a different thing where actually using a standardized six by six unit and working with a couple different configurations and seeing what sort of pattern and rhythm can you do when you actually just use the same drawer on all of them. So I did this one, and I did a four by four one. And, I, and it looks like there's a whole set of, there is a whole set of yellow drawers, but because I like working with color so much, it's not just, um, it's not just two sets of yellows, it's lots and lots of sets of different kinds of yellow. So every drawer front is actually different because I like mixing colors. And I'm gonna make a big transition now and, and talk a little bit about how I got interested in some other ways of generating form. This is uh, Josh Swan who came to me, showed up in the art department one day and said, um, I just trained as a traditional boat builder and I'd love to do something in the art department. And um, he was just one of those people that you could tell was a good guy and somebody that would be good to have connected with the department. And so our wood shop happens to be on the seventh floor of a, of a tall building. And so we started what was called the boat yard in the sky. And we built a 12 foot, about 12 and a half foot main, traditional main peapod. That's the finished boat uh, over the course of a semester. And um, we made a mock-up of it with sticks and we went to the freight elevator and we ran it diagonally from corner to corner to make sure we weren't building a boat in a basement. And, um, and we built it as absolutely large as we could um, to fit diagonally in the elevator. And he scaled down a traditional design. And I guess, um, and it was just a fantastic project. But this starts to get at what, what was interesting is it's a whole different way of generating form. And so um, these are the uh, stations. These are not part of the boat. This is just obviously just the framework that the boat is built over. But what a station does is I it identifies what the boat looks like at a specific point along its length. And that's been lofted in a full-scale drawing. And then the stringers go on, the lengthwise pieces, and they start to draw the actual shape of the hull. And then here are the steam-bent ribs going on. Hi, Karen. <laughs> um, there's the steam vent ribs going on uh, to sort of flesh out the form. And then the uh, cedar planking goes on. And that's almost done. And there's the boat fully painted. And there we are take, carrying it down the hall on the seventh floor and launching it in, uh, in the lake. And um, so I think the reason it was important was just to expose students and also myself to a whole different way of generating form. And the thing about boats is that they're curved everywhere. Like everything is a curved, constantly changing, curved in two dimensions. And a lot of the ways that we learn to build furniture are really lousy for making boats. And the way that um, that way of station thinking became quite important to me, but also um, to some of my students, I'm going to talk about one later. So this is um, just a screenshot of a website. Um, the next set of boats that we did in the shop were done with this geodesic aerolite technology. This is the gentleman, Platt Monfort, who unfortunately is no longer alive, who uh, invented this system of building boats. He's holding, um, he's holding a boat that weighs eight pounds and can carry, can carry almost a full grown, full, can, he says it can carry a person up to 150 pounds. And he's got this really interesting technology that combines traditional boat building and some modern materials like Kevlar and Dacron. And I'm gonna run you through some pictures. What happened is a student, this happens fairly often, a student comes into the woodshop and says, I'm working on this project, can you guys help me? And um, this guy came in and he said, I'm building a 14 foot boat in my apartment and actually I need to rip 16 foot stringers in order to, um, do a 14 foot boat and I can't do it in my apartment. Can you rip the stringers? So he breaks out the plans and we look at it and it's the plans for these boats. And so we, we ripped his wood for him, but then we got really interested in the technology. And one summer, uh, we built three boats in the wood shop. Um, and it, so two graduate students on the left is Ben Wooten and on the right is Matthias Pliesnig. And we, we each built our own boat, but we worked together a lot and we sort of figured it out, sort of the blind leading the blind. 
And um, here you can see our, th this, these boats are all about super light technology and simple technology. So here you can see our version of stations. Um, Matthias made his boat into a sailing rig, which makes it a little bit heavier. Um, ben, was a, ben wanted his to be comfortable, so he put foam cushions in it. And that boat that I, that's, that's my wife bird rowing the boat, and I, try, I tried to go as absolutely super light as I could, so I actually did a Dacron seat and minimal floorboards, and um, I don't actually know how much it weighs, but I, it's 12 feet long, I think it weighs about 30 pounds. And so it's um, super light, it's easy for a person to pick up. The problem is it's a little bit of a kite or a sail, and so uh, you have to, it, it can be a little bit tricky to maneuver, but it's just an amazing thing. It's, uh, it's like rowing, uh, I don't know, it's not a good analogy, but it, it's very responsive. It's sort of like rowing a sports car, or it moves sort of like a water bug. And, um, so anyways, the technology is all, the framework is all traditional, but the proportions of the pieces are super skinny, um, which makes it very lightweight. And then one of his tricks is the yellow thread is Kevlar thread, uh, which creates lots and lots and lots and lots of triangles. Triangles are good in terms of stiffness and strength. And uh, the Kevlar has zero stretch. And so it's attached at the gunnels and always runs diagonally. And it takes all the flex out of the hull without essentially adding no weight. And then the skin is an aircraft Dacron, which is a heat shrink formulation. And it's really aesthetically appealing in a couple ways I'll show you. But it is fragile. And so the uh, wooden parts are steamed. That's the steam box, which um, you can see it comes out of just a big pressure cooker that's heated with propane. And then a piece of sewer pipe. I think that's a fairly typical kind of steam box. And um, so here's Matthias and Ben are popping a bent rib inside the stringers, and then it'll get clamped in place. And so here's a hull that's more or less um, put together. So one of the things that the big surprise is when we, you put the boat in the water, you can see the water through the bottom. So it's, obviously it's not transparent, it's translucent. But you see the water through the bottom of the boat, and it's even cooler when you're moving forward because you can see the sort of patterns of turbulence as they move over the hull. So it's really quite amazing. And your foot, well, she has her feet on the floorboards, but when I row, my feet go out to the side. So your feet are on the Dacron, and you're sort of feeling the water under the boat, and there's just this layer of flexible fabric. It's really quite amazing. Um, so then I did one more um, of these boats at Haystack in a two-week workshop. And uh, then by this point, Matthias was my assistant, and we sort of knew what we were doing. We knew how the boats worked. And um, the workshop wasn't even about boat building. It was a chair-making workshop. <laughs> and we worked on the boats every night starting after dinner. And so we worked, uh, we worked like from 6.30 till, uh, we had some late nights, you know, 1.30 nights. But um, we, pr we got the boat in the water on the eighth day, um, just working part-time on it. Uh, so it was, it, I mean, it's just different when you have 15 people or however many we were wor working on the boat together. Um, so there, obviously, we're working in the daytime. Must have been lunch break. But so this hull, I mean, the, the hulls are really incredible. They're just, they, they hardly weigh anything. And so here on the left, you can see the Kevlar tape goes on with a hot melt tape where you iron the Kevlar to the gunnel, and then it gets a wood strip over the top that clamps it on. Um, and then here's the, so when you, or, so you order the plans and the kit for the boat, and it comes in the mail, they don't cost very much, and you order the plans for this 12-foot boat, and you're sort of excited to get this big box. And what comes is like a box this big, and so, <laughs> where's the boat? <laughs> and essentially what you get is a big piece of Dacron and the Kevlar thread and this kind of epoxy that he likes, and then a beautifully worked out uh, drawing that looks like it doesn't have enough information to build the boat, but what we found is um, as you explore it, if you know what your question is, the answer exists somewhere on the, on the plan. And so the Dacron goes on, it gets attached at the gunnel with that hot melt glue, which has quite a bit of strength in terms of being pulled sideways, very, a lot of strength, but it's impossible to get it on without wrinkles. So then you take the iron and you iron the boat, and it comes up tight as a drum. 
So um, very, very enjoyable experience and a new sort of way of developing complex forms. Um, so in, in conversation, um, these stations are located along a straight line, right? You locate your stations on what's called the strong back because boats are symmetrical objects. They're supposed to go straight. But what happens if you move, what happens if you change the orientation of the stations? And what happens if you make a boat for a specific um, turn? Not a very useful boat, but it starts, to ex it starts to get at questions of how do boats move through the water? What makes them move? What's their, what's their form of locomotion? And um, I, so I, wa I wanted to try some of these, and I thought about making a full-size boat and making it functional and putting it in the water. But it seemed like it wasn't, it sort of wasn't necessary that I could do them as, as a form of illustration and that people would get it from the illustration. So these are about um, three, three to four feet long. They're one-third scale models um, using the traditional techniques and bending the wood and everything, but not bothering to skin them or actually ever put them in the water. So I did a series of six of these boats. And so this one was thinking about a different form of locomotion, a swimming sort of form of locomotion. A sharp left turn. This one's called Over. And this one's called Drop. This one, this one was interesting. For me, this started to get at that thing of what happens in a cartoon where people on a boat go over a waterfall and then they hang there for a second and then they go Phew. And so the, only, the thing that's changing here is what is the orientation of the stations in space? So in this case, they're put on a disk. And then this one was probably the most complex in that the stations create a spiral. And so it was that idea of a boat screwing itself through the water. And here, here's a couple more studio shots. So you can see the stations on, in some of, their different, some of their different configurations. So I'm going to just show you some of the, my most recent uh, pieces, and then I'm going to change over and, and talk more directly about the Bentwood exhibition. These are um, boxes that are made on the bandsaw. They're, although they have curves, and they, you could describe them as bent wood, they're made subtractively from large chunks of wood. Uh, so it, all the cur any curve you see is just created by sawing it out. So these, this is a stacking box. And then this is the same geometry, same structure, but just treated in a different way in terms of this, how the surface works. And I recently revisited the industrial felt, and this time I'm wrapping it around um, pieces of firewood. And um, I started with this one in the front, just wrapping it around a piece of red cedar. And then on the next two, I split the wood and ran the, um, ran the industrial felt down the middle first and then started wrapping it, wrapping it around. These are, these are stools and they're domed on the bottom so they kind of rock. And uh, another recent piece just work, I've been collecting, it snows in Madison. And every, when I first moved there 20 years ago, I, every spring I would pull old shovels out of people's garbage cans because they like to throw them out at the end of the winter. And in the begin, I used to get amazing shovel handles 20 years ago. And um, now I, I'm lucky if I get one in, its, in the spring that uh, doesn't have plastic on it. So that's my criteria. I don't want plastic. And I wanted to make a fence. And so I, have, I had quite a few of these accumulated. And until I, I did this project, I never paid for one or bought one. But, um, I did this bench with an um, old piece of wood that I'd had in my shop for a long time. So 
So these are currently in the faculty show. Yeah, and I wanted to end with one more piece of bent wood, which I th thought was kind of fun. On the UW campus, we have the National Forest Products Laboratory where they, br they break wood and measure how many pounds of pressure it takes to break it. And so I gave them some wood and asked them to break it and then give it back to me. And um, they, uh, they love doing it. And so I, I gave them a bunch of different kinds of wood. This is, just, this is oak. And I went there while they did it. It's a huge hydraulic press with a screen that shows how many pounds of pressure are going on. It's done inside of a steel tube so it stays straight and doesn't deflect to the side. But there might have been an inch of wood sticking out above the tube. And then they got it. They really compressed it about an, I'm estimating about an inch with huge amounts of pressure. And so what you get are these really interesting, you get failure, you get wood failure, but it can be incredibly beautiful the way that it fails. This, this is actually my favorite, one of the failures. And the other thing about it is as you're watching it on the scale, it goes up to like 30,000 pounds of pressure and then it fails and you see it drop way down, but it drops down to, you know, like 6,000 pounds. So even in its failed condition, it's like strong enough to hold a small elephant. So that's the last piece of my work. And now I have to, um, I'm changing PowerPoints. So, oh, this is the right one. All right. Okay, I'm gonna talk about the show. And uh, I wanted to start with um, a couple weeks ago, I was walking and I was at the a convention in Los Angeles and I was walking around with some friends and we walked by a storefront and I saw this thing and it kind of caught my eye and I sort of recognized something going on. And then I saw this chair and um, I realized that this was the workshop and showroom of um, Greg Fleischman, who's someone I've known about for a long, long time, but I'd never met or I'd never seen much of his work in person. And I realized uh, that his work should probably have been in our Bentwood show. <laughs> and that's why <laughs> I think it must be really, really hard to be a professional curator because how do, you rem how do you remember all the cool stuff that you've seen over the years? And this guy is a total genius. He's been working on this um, technology for decades. He's done lots and lots and lots of chairs. We went in and we talked with him for a long time. He's a mathematical genius. And uh, this is um, some of the chairs he's put together. So these are made from flat sheets of plywood, which he, I think in the old days, he probably used a router and cut the pattern. Now I think it's all cut by CNC router. He cuts these patterns and then he flexes the hell out of the wood and does these amazing structures and um, both, and, and of course it appeals to me because of the way it's a three-dimensional form coming from a two-dimensional form. So these are some of the professional illustrations, not my snapshots. But there in the, in the line drawings in the back, you can see a little more about how it comes out of the flat sheet. So that's the professional shot of the, pic the chair that was sitting in the window when we walked by. So maybe this is the beginning of the next show. Uh, and he's using the technology to make uh, uh, quick pop-up housing for um, um, disaster situations. And this is a uh, this is a car that this is a car that he made. For, it's a parade vehicle, and uh, so it's really amazing. It has kind of rope around the wheels. He says it has about 20 miles on it. <laughs> um, so, anyways, so I'm going to give you a quick tour of the show. So I'm going quick because I don't want you to cheat and look at the pictures and think you've seen the show and you don't have to go. So you should go see the show. And what I'm going to, so what I'm going to try and do in the next, uh, in the next, the rest of my presentation, I'm going to um, try and convince you why you should go see the show. So um, there, we included a couple of um, historic figures. I mean, one contemporary, we, we included um, a chair by, um, by the Tonnet brothers. And um, I think that, so when I was doing a little research, so anyways, this is the very early version. There's hundreds of different chairs that they've done. And um, in terms of the technology of wood bending, the incorporating the bending into um, industrial situations, uh, they've just been incredibly important. 
but also I think the other thing is just sort of maintaining this high aesthetic standard in, in the designs. And also, I mean, it's not just the bending, it's also this incredibly clever, um, it's flat pack, right? It's flat pack from the last century. That's pretty smart. And uh, when I was doing the research, I read something online, so it must be right, right? But it said that in, in peak years, they made 865,000 chairs, which is staggering. Is that possible? I don't know. <laughs> but so I think it's, it's they're so important that um, Katie suggested that they should be part of the show. And um, this is uh, Frank Gehry, a schematic of Frank Gehry's 19, 1977 house in Santa Monica, California, which I actually got to see in the late 70s, and it was really something to see this house. And it's really weird because all the pictures that I could find don't show how crude it actually was. It's in a very suburban neighborhood with very, very regular houses. And when it was up in the late 70s, it was raw. It had chain link fence and exposed plywood. And I don't know where it's gone in these pictures, but um, it, it had a really big impact on me 35 years ago. And um, one of the things I've found with Frank Gehry's work is that it's kind of overexposed in terms of imagery. We've seen it so much. But very often, when I actually see his pieces that I thought I wasn't going to like, when I see them in person, they blow me away. And it just happened to me again just now when I was out in California. This is the Disney Concert Hall. And of course, I'd seen a lot of pictures of it. But to get to explore it was really amazing. Uh, oops, too quick. Um, and one of the things that's really interesting is he includes um, some ways that you can get in behind the building. There's a walkway. And um, I thought it was really great because in a way, a way he doesn't hide the fact that it's about, a, it's about a f this beautiful, sensuous facade. But then he has this walkway where he lets you in behind to see the erector set construction system of how, of how it all works. And I found it very appealing. It made it seem more genuine and less like sort of strip mall facadism and more like, here's how I wanted to put this thing together. Um, so I, w I was really impressed by, by that building. And then when he's turned his attention to furniture, he's done some really brilliant, uh, brilliant work. Obviously not bent wood, but cardboard in this case. And then this, um, this one's called Power Play. I think, I think this one's called Power Play. Um, so when he put his attention to bent wood furniture, he pretty much hit a home run on his first try. So that's why those two are in, and the rest are, um, are um, people that Katie and I picked out. So uh, Clifton Monteith is a willow furniture maker, and uh, so there's the piece with Clifton, and there's the piece without Clifton. I'm not quite sure which one I prefer. <laughs> but it, he just seems so, like he's kind of, yeah, he's kind of grown into the piece. But the other thing I like about this is that so much of what the work is about is this sort of a semi-transparent grid structure that develops. And it's sort of like you can see him, but you can't see him. His body sort of disappeared. Um, but anyways, he's, he's really a genius at working with Willow in this uh, furniture format. And um, the pieces are just absolutely stunning. Um, beautifully detailed. He also works with willow in, a, in another way where it's more like a mosaic, working with the um, different colors of willow. And there are um, many, 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 many different species of willow. But so this isn't obviously about bending willow. This is, um, mosa I, think, I think it's called mosaic work. But so um, the thing I wanted to talk a little bit about is just the process of bending that happens here. It's a very, um, direct you go you go out and you drive with Clifton on country roads and he has willow radar and and he'll be, just be driving along and he'll go ah oh, there it is and then you have to pull over to the side of the road and he goes and he checks it out and then so this was gathering the willow for a workshop a resident a mini residency that Clifton did at our school and um, then it, just sort of bringing the bundles bringing the bundles in and then um, you can see that in this particular species that we gathered was quite green. It ages and it turns to a sort of a more coppery color over time. Um, and so Clifton works in the shop and students work with him. Um, Clifton likes to tell stories. He's a raconteur. And, and this is definitely a per case of the right person picking the right technique because it's a very quiet, calm sort of way of working. The only electricity are his cordless drills. And otherwise, he works with hand tools. 
and so it's not, not noisy, it's not sort of a high danger thing, and Clifton can tell stories while he's working and developing this um, tabletop. It's, it goes together with um, nails, which, which uh, the green wood actually shrinks around the nail and becomes very strong as it becomes more dry and working on the substructure. And so this, uh, the, the green willow is uh, very flexible and it involves uh, quite a bit of um, touch. It's very kind of haptic and Clifton takes the wood and kind of massages it. And what you're trying to do is you're trying to get the cell structure inside the stick to slide on, slide on itself because it has to relocate. And so he sort of loosens it up slowly. It's like calisthenics before the big bend. And uh, it's really an amazing hypnotic process. And so that was the, that was the finished table that we made. He, he did most of the work, but the students got to do a lot, and it was quite, quite quick and very rewarding. And I didn't figure I could do a slideshow on willow work in North Carolina without mentioning Patrick Doherty. So, you know, another total genius with the material who works at a totally different scale and uses it a little, you know, he's not articulating each line. It's almost the line functions maybe a little bit more as a sort of a scribble that develops the form. But <clears throat> um, Yuri Kobayashi made a piece called Courage doing a residency at Madison. So I have a couple of shots of her working on the piece. And I, I think there's some similarities with Clifton uh, in that I think she's paying a lot of attention to the line quality of each individual piece. And they're also that very, very light proportion. This, there's a couple pictures of her um, kind of working with the piece and manipulating it. It's a big piece, but it weighs nothing. Uh, it's super light. And um, she spends a lot of time getting the form exactly the way that she wants. And I would sort of ask her to explain the form and why the form existed. And for her, these are they're really abstract uh, forms that represent, this is my favorite shot of the piece, I just, I really, really love that. Um, and for her, I think they're very much connected to her, her inner thoughts, feelings, emotions, um, and this somehow represents that to her. So it, it's really a sort of an abstraction, but it's highly personal and she cares very much about where every part of that ends up. Um, I, I first became aware of her work. This is the work from her MFA exhibition. And the, um, there's another view of it. And then this, this piece, I think, is a really, really incredible piece. This piece really just totally blew me away. I, I, some of the things I love about it are, in terms of being an object, it has very indeterminate boundaries. It sort of fades away. It has areas of dense structure and areas where it almost sort of disappears. And that's not a typical approach to object making. We sort of like our objects to exist. So it's sort of a different kind of mindset. And uh, uh, I thought it also does that thing where what's not there becomes as important as what is there. And so um, it's a very straightforward, very linear structure at this point. But then as she moved on, she did start to work more with curved forms. So here, just uh, this is a very tall piece, I think it's I'm not sure how tall it is, but um, I think it's this tall or more. And just introducing that one very gentle curve changes the, changes the whole perception of the piece. And then it gets even more complicated. This piece is very large again. It's about six feet around. And one of the most amazing things about this piece is that it is deconstructible. It's all put together with wedges. Um, so she can um, move the piece as long as she shows up to put it back together again. And there, you know, I think one of the, this, this thing she does where she has the parts separate and then come together into a coherent whole, they're really, really amazing objects. This was a suspended sculpture, but I just really, really, really like this um, approach to constructing a wheel. And she has also done some work where, with a different kind of bending where it's more of a solid form bending. Um, changing over to um, 
Mike Jarvie, a very amazing person who is the woodworker in residence at a place called Crabtree Farms, which is a farm partway between um, Milwaukee and Chicago and Illinois. And this is what it looks like. And his shop is in the wing of this barn building. And um, he is an amazing woodworker. He's got this um, bandsaw mill and he harvests his own wood. So he's doing it start to finish. And uh, at some point, the owners of this farm realized how talented he was and they sent him to John Makepeace's school in Parnham, England, and he studied there for two years. And um, they, they've been sort of allowing him to experiment with furniture um, in his shop. And so he has um, these two tables. The Jarvey One Piece table is the one on the top and the folded bench on the bottom. And they're two staggeringly amazing pieces of wood bending. In this case, it's, uh, it's some very intense uh, steaming techniques. So this piece is made from a single piece of wood. It's essentially unfolded. So, let me see if I can get a little. So this piece here is in a, a little groove that he chops in, in the underside of the top. So it's stuck up in there. But if you were to um, pop that out, and then this piece would go back against there and this whole thing would swing back up. It probably wouldn't do that because it's dry. Um, it would go back some way. I don't know how far it would go back. But he came up with this design when he was studying in Parnham and John Makepeace said, you'll never get it to work. It's never gonna work. And I think maybe that was a very um, good comment to make because Mike never gave up until he got it to work. And so this is this little section in the middle where the legs are still attached to the top. This is the blank. Um, so what, what he does is he, he uses a large bandsaw and he cuts all the way in, backs back out, turns the bandsaw blade around, backs it in, and then saws out like that, and then takes the whole thing back out. So he's got it pre-cut. He steams it for quite a long time, longer than I would have guessed. There you can see the cuts. So there's the blank and sitting on top of an unfolded table. And unfortunately, we and here's two, two of the tables. Um, bent into shape. We didn't get to see him bend one of these. I would just love to see him unfold the table. Um, but so if you think about it, everything here has is, is been cut with a bandsaw, so it's got that sort of rough bandsaw texture. And then he comes back in and he cleans everything up. And they are just amazing objects. And this is another, um, this is the one, this is the um, single plank just very aggressively crimped at the corner. And he's, um, this is a little illustration he has on the left that shows as you take a piece of wood that thick and you bend it around a corner, you're requiring the outside part of the wood to stretch and the inside part of the wood to compress. And so he's just cut thin strips. The strips are all the same length, but when you put them around the curve, that's what happens. They go sort of, they get stretched. And so then what you see here on the right is a close-up of one of his um, joints and you see the compression on the inside and you see the tension on the outside. Does that make sense? Kind of. And there's, there's another example. So uh, they're just, that corner itself, that detail just tells you so much about what's happening to the material as it bends. So these, uh, he bends these with a forklift, which of course the students that I brought over just thought that was the coolest thing they'd ever seen. And so this is the jig that he's put together. And so we sawed that big blank. You saw the blank that we sawed with the bandsaw mill. And this is his um, steaming thing, because it has to be really big. And there he is pulling his piece of wood out. And one of the ways that, and so now you can see on the blank, one thing that's interesting is um, he, does scoop, he does make a scoop out in that blank before he puts it in the steamer. So he's removing some material on the inside part of that corner so it'll fold in better. And that's really interesting. That connects back to the other coolest bending in the world are the um, Northwest Coast Indian kerf bent boxes, which are just mind blowing. But they do a similar sort of a technique to this. And then uh, this is applying tension to the end of the board to try and help with the fact that, um, the fact that you're stretching the wood so there's the blank. Is this the video? I think this is the video.
So you can see a little bit of the steam coming off, but it's, it's very, very hot. He steams it for four hours, and then he says he has six minutes. He has six minutes to finish the band. So he's, he's on his forklift pulling it out. Well, he says that you have to be done in six minutes. You're gonna have a problem with the clamp here. Go ahead, you can pop it off. That's my brilliant jump off from there. You got a problem with the clamp. It's not quite done, but you saw the most dramatic part. I wonder why it stopped. There it goes. So you get the idea. So I, th I really admire that work because I feel that um, you know, he didn't come through any sort of an academic route. He, um, he really figured that stuff out on his own by trial and error. Um, so I thought I'd go from that super simple one piece amazing bend to Michael Cooper, who um, is crazy. <laughs> Completely crazy. This is a, a vehicle that he made, and I saw this for, this is at the San Diego Furniture Society conference when it's, it was under um, construction in process. So this is Michael. He's like a totally normal, like he's about the nicest person in the world. He wears button-down shirts, <laughs> and he, he's great, amazing, and he makes these totally crazy objects. Um, and uh, this one is also a video, and you get a little bit of a sense of how excited he gets about this stuff. The starters will be missing, so you'll come up with a pneumatic uh, wrench, and you'll whirl the motors, and they'll each start, so then there'll be a little panel with a light to go. So number one is on, number two is on, and this will be great, so that they'll only be able to idle, or at least not move these shafts at that point. So when they're all on, that should be really screaming and making a lot of smell. <laughs> That's right by your head. So I, I, I've been following Michael's work for a long time, and maybe because we're not in California and he's a California person, but I feel like he's been really under-recognized and under-appreciated for what he does. He is a complete and total genius, and he makes, he makes wood rubbery in a way that I've never seen any, anybody else do it. Um, so here, here's some details from that piece under construction. That's some serious woodworking. Um, this is the piece, so that now he has a traveling retrospective which I got to see at the Fuller Craft Museum. So here's the same piece, I saw this just a couple months ago. Um, this is the same piece finished out. And there's that, what that seat looks like completely finished out. Um, these are some other pictures I took at, the, at his retrospective show. Personally, I like some of these really simple pieces. These um, tricycles, I think, are just absolutely amazing. So the, I don't know if you can see it's a terrible iPhone picture, but it's um, the tricycle body, the tricycle frame is a gun frame. Not a gun frame, it's a gun. And this is, I, I, my understanding of this is this is essentially a um, way over the top soapbox derby vehicle. No, no power except gravity. <clears throat> so this funny uh, backrest piece from the chair, it's just one of the most amazing pieces of woodworking I've seen in a long time. And again, this is just a display. Um, uh, you know, I, th I think it, it I, I'm guessing that these also mean differently in California with California car culture and so forth. I mean, we all know about California car, car culture, but I bet, they sh I bet this piece shows differently in California than Connecticut. Um, Jeremy Holmes, I, 
I, I've, I've, I've had to work with Jeremy Holmes' work by image. I haven't seen the, the pieces yet, but I love the images. I love this work that's crammed into these architectural spaces. And um, again, you know, a person, he comes after Michael Cooper because of that same quality of making wood rubbery, but in a very different sort of way. It seemed, this seems to be almost sort of a, a line drawing or you know, a, a line in space, um, almost like it's drawn. And then I really love these pieces that are sort of engaged in a dialogue with the architecture that's containing them or trying to contain them. I love this picture, it's amazing. So he's figured out a scarf joint where he's able to make the wood longer. And in the catalog, there's a quote that one of them is some crazy length, like, a mile, yeah, that's crazy. There's a piece up in the Sherrill Center. He did it so on campus here. He did a residency. Ah, okay. Oh, so you you probably have all seen the work that I haven't seen yet. And so I, I, my understanding, this is a day shot, and that's the same piece at night, I believe. And then when you when he treats it more in an object context, it becomes much more of a carefully drawn, uh, drawn composition, less of a sort of scribble in space and more of a tight composition. Very beautiful. Uh, Don Miller um, um, runs the wood program at the University of the Arts in Philadelphia. This is Don holding one of his babies. And Don in his studio, I, I, just, I love going to people's studios. I thought it'd be interesting for people to see sort of the kinds of things that different people have on, on their walls and what, and what you see. Um, this is new, a new thing that he's developing. I haven't seen this yet in any of his finished work, but these are um, panels that would be in, they're sort of his playing with frame and panel. I believe this is also a video. Sound and, 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 and haptic things come together. So there's a sound there. And, uh, and so, so he's, um, and it's sort of, they rattle around, they're loosely captured. And I think what, what's important and what I, the reason I'd like to show that is uh, for Don, that sort of, that uh, the quality of touch is very, very important in his work. And so um, this was a piece that was in process. And the thing about Don's work is it looks really simple at first glance. So. This piece opens to this piece. But the more you think about it and the more you look at it, there's an incredible sophistication behind the work. So in order to get that simple piece to work like that, it's got a highly complex hand put together hinge that, that will allow you to do that action that makes, that allows that piece to exist, those doors to work on that form. One other thing that's interesting about Don's background, it's uh, musical instrument making. I think you can see it a little bit in, in these forms. Uh, very important for, for Don was uh, coopering techniques. And he, um, I think he really delved pretty deeply into coopering when he was a, a graduate student and worked um, with the language of the bucket in some really interesting ways. This bucket is, has another bucket right next to it that's sort of sinking into the wall. <laughs> Bless you. Um, and I think even, I think coopering even informs a piece like this. I think it's that coopering, the idea of a gradual change repeated multiple times over small parts generates a fairly complex form and space. So I think a lot of what's going on in Don's work has to do with uh, rep carefully calculated repetition, um, things that look simple, but when you actually analyze the individual parts that are making this up, it's really quite sophisticated and complex. He often works with this um, white finish on oak uh, because I think he's really trying to get people to be uh, form-centric and really concentrate on the form, and he doesn't want to give himself the luxury of pattern decoration on the surface. <clears throat> So even in a, a very traditional, uh, traditionally derived piece like this, he sort of erases decoration uh, in terms of color and, and puts it strictly in the, in the shaping. So it really accentuates the form, the formal form. I really, I, l I love this piece because of its semi-transparent qualities, which you see a little bit better right here.
I would say about this work, it, uh, it's very, very hard to photograph and capture the qualities that count. So yet another reason you need to drive out to Hendersonville. And the last, uh, I believe the last person is Matthias Pliesnig, and here he is uh, working on the boat. And the reason I put a picture of him working on the boat is the boats were even more influential on him than they were on me, and he got very interested. I'll show you how the work evolved from the boats. But when he, he was first in school, his early MFA work uh, was also looked a lot like coopering, and it was looking at generating forms um, using very thin materials, in some cases stapling it together on the left, and in some cases edge gluing it. Um, and I think this lower one on the right is um, maybe gets the closest to what he was interested in. He was interested in if you could get forms, oh, actually the same one, you could get forms that you were almost sort of turning them inside out, where the outside becomes the inside, and it's hard to tell what's inside, what's outside. They were, um, they were quite um, mathematically complex and quite amazing pieces. <clears throat> I would say that uh, I think these would not have been possible without um, computer modeling. So it's, it's interesting that, um, I'll talk about that a little bit more. Um, so, so Matthias got interested in this idea of stations and stations generating form. And so this was his first uh, exploration of that. And he actually fabricated all the stations and the stations became an integral part of the finished piece. And that, that was the finished piece. It's really long, I think it's like eight feet long. And so he fabricated each station to a sort of furniture level of quality, which is not yet how boats are done. And this one, the change here is that this form was built over stations which were then removed. And it builds even more on the boat, uh, the boat structure in that this has uh, stringers and ribs and stringers, but it actually has extra layers. It gets thicker than that. So here now he's, he's starting to think, he's starting to u do a similar sort of thing. You can see the strong back on the bottom, but he's organizing his stations uh, in a more complex way and they're um, getting bigger and smaller. He doesn't have the, the, the nautical requirement of making a shape that actually moves through the water. So he can explore some other kinds of things. There you can see his first bench up on the wall up there. some other studio shots. And this was some of the early computer modeling for the, for the early work. It gets quite a bit sophisticated later on. And this is actually the very first version of the piece which is in the show, so it sort of has evolved from this to a much more kind of elaborate form. I think the thing that's somewhat, that I think one of the things that's interesting about this way of building is it's both sort of old fashioned boat building technology, but it also uh, looks like computer modeling. It looks like a computer grid. So it has that interesting sort of back and forth. And this was um, uh, as he started to go up in scale, and they actually have the best photographs of this piece, so I'm, I'm going to explore it a little bit here with some details. So it, it can hold two people and it offers various different sort of ways and places and forms of sitting. And then this is what the computer modeling looks like now. He periodically sends me emails and I get these and it's just like, wow, these are amazing. And he's, compla he's placing them sort of in context. Um, so he's still working on these. He's doing these as, as commission work. And um, I think that's the last one. And I thought that I'll stop now. I went a little bit long, but I wanted to, he's got a really interesting video on YouTube. And um, if it will work, I'm gonna just run it. It's a stop motion animation. And if you turn the soundtrack low, it's, a, it's like six minutes long, so I'll just let it run and uh, answer questions. Although you'll be really distracted by this. So. Uh, so here you see the strong back and the station tuning up to the
Okay. That's it. That means they went home. <laughs> Oh, do they have a finish on Oh, yes, they are steam. Oh my gosh, they are so steam. Yeah, they are really steam. I mean, especially anything that goes across the pond. Yeah. So a big part of his thing is sourcing wood. He has to get lots and lots of good green oak. So it's gonna go on for another four minutes, so. In, in this town, or in, in Canada? Michael Fortune? Yeah. Michael Fortune knows a lot about Oh, interesting, interesting. So I'm, I'm happy to answer que any questions you have at this point. I know this is a little distracting. But and I have a microphone <laughs> that you have to use. I will say steam venting is kind of, it's, it's interesting. I've, when you talk to people about steam venting, it's, um, there isn't like one right answer. Like people come up with things that they say work for them that are not according to the book. Like there's the book put out by the some laboratory somewhere that says these are the facts sir but there's an awful lot of people bending stuff in ways that are directly contradictory to the facts right you find that Brent? <clears throat> I'm not sure if it's a direct question um, but we're Different, the different pieces we've been looking at, some of them that have a, a thinner diameter of wood that's being bent versus the larger piece that was um, bent. How much time like, would he have, is he bending those forms and then putting them on this piece? Because it doesn't seem like he'd have time before they cooled to bend them on such a long piece. Yeah, um, he, uh, uh, Matthias soaks his in a trough of water so they're really, really wet. And they're not huge diameter. There's this very rough rule of thumb that for every inch of thickness, you have to steam something an hour. But he's nowhere near an inch on his parts. So he says that he's only steaming them for 10 or 15 minutes. And see, like he says, if you steam it longer, it gets too dried out. Other people say different things. But so there's that very general rule about an inch per hour. And then um, it sits in there and it cooks for however long. And then when you get it out of the steamer you have to wear gloves and you have to move really fast because what's making it flexible is a combination of moisture and heat and the heat goes away really fast the moisture doesn't go away that fast but you lose the heat so I forgot to mention I, when Yuri's piece was on the screen she um, steamed her parts and put them onto her piece but then she had a thing that she bought which is a steamer from a, um, a dry cleaning shop where they steam the clothes. And so she would, she would um, like steam the pieces while they were on her form and sort of massage them some more, keep them hot and massage them more. She, sw she swore that that worked. Thank you, I'm sorry I went long. Thank you. Go to Hendersonville. <laughs>